Keep a close watch over your actions, speech, and mind, and conduct yourself with composure. Don't talk too much and create difficulties for yourself. Watch your language and laugh with restraint. Nokraba Cave As the years passed, Meiji Gao's meditation developed a definite pattern and direction, and each new encounter with the spirit world reinforced her momentum. She spent countless hours examining the pain and suffering of other living beings, but she neglected to reflect back on herself and the emotional attachments that rooted her in Sangsara's recurring sequence of death and rebirth. Because her visions involved contact with the mind's internal sense fields, accessed by an inward focus of awareness, she viewed them as explorations of her own mind and its profound psychic capabilities. She believed that by investigating the phenomena arising in her samadhi meditation, she could learn the truth about them, and by that means understand the mental awareness that perceived them. But, although the worlds that appeared in her spiritual visions were realms of being every bit as real and distinctive as the human realm, they were also just as external to the perspective of the meditator, the one who perceived them. Though not solid and tangible, these phenomena were, by their very nature, objects of perception, and thus extraneous to the awareness that knew them. By focusing exclusively on her visions, Meiji Gao's meditation had become preoccupied with the outer spiritual universe, which caused her to overlook the amazing inner world that existed within her own heart and mind. Meiji Gao failed to understand this fundamental fault in her practice, and Ajahn Kampan did not possess enough innate wisdom to point out the mistake. He himself had never progressed beyond the level of samadhi and its psychic effects, so he could not lead her beyond her infatuation with the spiritual dimension. Though his mind was rooted in exceptional powers of concentration, he lacked genuine insight into the fundamentally transient and unsatisfactory nature of spiritual phenomena. Although Mechi Gao believed Ajahn Kampan to be a competent guide, she had yet to understand her need for a truly exceptional teacher. Machi Gao's increasing infatuation with the varieties of conscious existence became strong. She craved for the excitement of new experiences and greater knowledge, the very craving that causes all sentient beings to wander endlessly in Sansara's spiritual universe. Machi Gao had yet to fully comprehend this lesson about the truth of suffering and its primary cause, and Ajahn Kampan, with all his powers of concentration, was unable to guide her away from the dangers of strongly favoring Samadhi over wisdom. Thus, Machi Gao became intoxicated by the peaceful tranquility of Samadhi, and, inadvertently, had become addicted to its wondrous powers of perception. Machi Gao lived on Pugao Mountain from 1937 to 1945, a period during which the Japanese invaded Thailand and dragged it into an unfolding regional conflict that soon became a major battlefront in World War II. Warplanes flew bombing missions directly over the mountain retreat, and often dropped unused bombs on the mountainside before landing at a nearby airbase. The periodic and deafening explosions sent the monks and nuns scrambling for safe cover under the overhanging cliff. Only Machi Gao remained unperturbed, calmly continuing her meditation without fear or annoyance. She was determined to develop her resolve by dedicating her body and mind to the search for Tamma. She knew that she had to be resolute on the path if she expected to transcend suffering in her lifetime. During one period of constant bombardment, the disruption to the nuns' meditative environment became so severe that Machi Gao and several other nuns moved from Pugao Mountain to Nokraba Cave for more seclusion. Hiking on looping mountain trails for the better part of a day, they arrived at an adjacent mountain range, far removed from the military's normal flight path. Nokraba was an extensive network of caves carved into the rugged mountainside, which afforded each nun a separate, secluded stone chamber, where she could practice meditation in quiet solitude. Emerging from deep samadhi, late on the first night, the outward flow of Mechi Gao's consciousness was confronted by a large, serpent-like deity, which she immediately recognized as a naga, a spiritual being whose natural environment was hollow caverns of the earth and the watery domains beneath them. Nagas had always fascinated Machi Gao by their ability to change their physical appearance at will, often presenting themselves in human guise. With audacious disregard, the Naga quickly wrapped its spectral coils around her body, arched its reptilian face close to hers, and, in a teasing tone, 
threatened to eat all the nuns before sunrise. Mechi Gao understood the power of not being afraid to die. Face to face with its massive head, she calmly cautioned the Naga to consider the moral repercussions of its rashness. She reminded the Naga that nuns were children of the Lord Buddha, the ideal of spiritual perfection, and they should never be violated. When the Naga maintained its defiant posture, she retorted that if it really intended to eat the nuns, it should take her first. The Naga immediately opened wide its snake-like mouth and prepared to strike her. But, due to the mysterious powers of Mechi Gao's virtue, its mouth suddenly began to burn so hot that it yelled out in pain. Chastened and humbled, the Naga sheepishly assumed the formal appearance of a young man and became friendly. In the guise of a young man, the Naga agreed to share his abode with the nuns. But he remained a mischievous creature, restlessly flitting about and never staying still. The strange young man liked to sit on a rock in the middle of the cave and play a panpipe very loudly, the sounds echoing playfully around the hollow cavern. But every time he approached Machi Gao, who was seated in meditation, the sounds from his panpipe became mysteriously muffled, as though the notes could not quite emerge from the mouth of his flute. This enigma puzzled and frustrated him. As time went on, it made him increasingly uncomfortable to think that she could exert control over the sounds he made. At the same time, he grew more and more impressed by her unusual powers, and despaired of ever getting the better of her. One day, Manchi Gao saw the young man approaching with his panpipe and asked him where he was going. The Naga teased her, saying that he had intended to flirt with a woman in the village, but thought it might be better to flirt with her instead. She shot him a scolding glance and retorted that she was a woman of moral virtue who had no desire for men. She urged him to develop basic moral principles within himself, insisting that moral virtue was the basis of those special qualities that every living being should cherish and hold on to. She explained that moral restraint formed a barrier that prevented living beings from abusing each other's material and spiritual wealth, and that it also protected and maintained one's own inner worth. Without morality's protective restraint, mistreatment and negligence would run so rampant in the world that there would hardly be an island of peace and security left. Mechi Gao urged the young Naga to cease his callous disregard for spiritual values and to reform his moral outlook in line with Buddhist principles. Eliminating such a blight from his heart would produce only peace and happiness for himself and others. Impressed by her arguments, the young Naga accepted his faults and asked for her forgiveness. Responding to the softening in his heart, Mechi Gao exhorted him to observe the five basic moral precepts. First, you must abstain from harming living creatures. By doing so, you will learn to restrain your anger and promote loving kindness. You must abstain from taking things without their owner's consent. By discarding the mentality of a thief, greed is held in check and renunciation is given room to grow. All improper sexual relations must be abandoned, because refraining from sexual misconduct helps to subdue sensual lust and develop a spirit of contentment. By abstaining from lying and always telling the truth, you rein in tendencies towards false speech and emphasize truthfulness in all your dealings. Abstaining from intoxicants avoids harmful mental excitement and cultivates the development of mindful awareness, which is the basic prerequisite for maintaining all the moral precepts in a smooth and even manner. Having convinced him to adopt these fundamental moral principles, Machi Gao taught him that, in addition to moral restraint, generosity and meditation are vitally important elements, that they lay the foundation for spiritual self-reliance in this life and in all future lives. All living beings are the product of their actions, and they must take full responsibility for the consequences they encounter, for no one else can shoulder that responsibility. The nuns at Nokraba Cave relied on some of the local people to provide them with raw rice and other cooking supplies. They foraged daily for forest greens, edible tubers, and wild mushrooms to supplement their diet, but their supply of rice and pickled fish depended on local supporters. The women who supplied them with basic requisites became faithful devotees, and Machi Gao often rewarded their devotion by relating her meditation experiences as lessons in the value of moral virtue. But when news of her power to tame the Naga reached the wider village community, 
many local people became fearful and uneasy, long steeped in animistic beliefs. They were superstitious and wary of anyone whose spiritual powers transcended those of the local deities. They associated Machi Gao's taming of the Naga with magical powers, which both awed and frightened them. Nokraba Cave was situated in a wooded region where village people normally hunted and gathered wild plants. Stories of Machi Gao's power made the locals feel uneasy about setting foot in the area. Complaints began to emerge. At that time, there were unseasonably heavy rainfalls, day and night, which caused extensive flooding in low-lying villages. The nuns at the cave were soon accused of causing these torrential downpours and the ensuing floodwaters. It was also suggested that the nuns' presence accounted for recent Japanese army incursions into the region. A series of unwarranted accusations eventually convinced Machi Gao that she should leave the area. Although Nakraba Cave provided conditions of ideal seclusion, circumstances in the surrounding countryside were less than favorable. She was concerned that misconceptions about her continued presence might cause others further inconvenience. She thus decided to return to the Bugao Mountain with her group of nuns.